Colossians and chapter number three, commencing the reading in verse number five up to verse number 11. Here then is God's holy word. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, the sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of this, the wrath of God is coming. If this, in this you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its new practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Amen. In this session, we shall be examining the subject, believers involvement in uh, progressive sanctification. And we have looked at the fact that we have been called to progressive sanctification. Now, oftentimes, people ask the question, which is what I'm going to present to us, and then we shall, in light of God's word, examine this question and put the question in its context. And the question goes something like this. If the process of sanctification, that is, the process of making us righteous or holy, is accomplished by the Spirit of God, then what is the role of the believer in the process? Have you asked that question yourself? Have you had people ask the same question? What is the role? No. Put differently, people ask, if salvation is by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, what role do I play in my salvation? <coughs> have you asked that question or have you had that question asked? Because we insist, indeed, as the Bible insists, that salvation is by God's grace alone, and the word alone is very important, that is through faith alone, in Christ alone. Wherefore, where is my role in it? And we want to examine that as regards progressive sanctification, the continual renewal of the new man, the believer is involved. That is the word. The believer is involved. The believer is actively involved is there would be a word you'd love to underline is the word actively. The believer is actively involved in progressive sanctification. He is fully and completely involved in sanctification progressively. The point I'm making is this, that the believer is not passive when it comes to progressive sanctification. The believer is not dormant, is not a quasi-partner when it comes to progressive sanctification. The point I'm making is this. The believer is not even partially involved. That is accomplishing some portion of it and God does the other part of it. The believer is fully involved and actively involved. The believer is neither helping the Spirit of God, nor, apart from the Spirit of God, accomplishing sanctification. It is not a work where we help the Spirit. See the point? And we cannot attain to perfection and sanctification apart from the Spirit. That's the point we're making. Therefore, you will hear the Apostle Paul write elsewhere in Galatians, chapter number 5, that we must walk by the Spirit. Have you ever read those words? That we must walk by the Spirit. We must be led by the Spirit. It is a work in which we are involved, involved but we are involved in, in a manner so that the Spirit is the one leading us. 
We are obeying the Spirit as He's leading us. We follow the guidance and the leading of the Spirit through the Word of God. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Have you seen someone who is involved in plowing his shamba back at home using ogza? Have you ever seen ogza in the village? Sorry, this is town, but in the village they use ogza to plow. Now, what happens in plowing? Who is the prime mover in plowing? The oxen, okay? They push or they pull the, you know, the plow, but the plowman must of necessity put his hands on the plow. And he must guide that plow as he plows through, isn't it? But who provides the strength? The oxen. The point I'm making is this. That the Spirit of God gives us the ability, the strength, and the grace with which to be sanctified, but even so, ourselves, we must put our hands on the plow, and we must plow. So it is not a question of either or, it is not a question of helping the Spirit, it is not a question of doing my part, the work is accomplished, both in tandem, at the same time. The problem that arises why this is important is because we usually oftentimes draw the distinction be, be, between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Do you see the problem comes? We like drawing you know, these two truths. We like drawing a wedge between them. We like you know, driving a difference between them. That on the one end, God is sovereign. And so he's saving by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And forgetting the other side, that even so, man is responsible. It is a misunderstanding of the work of God. Now, two things I wanted to see quickly in this session, and then we shall be done. These two things involve one, and us to see and analyze the necessity of our involvement in our progressive sanctification. In other words, why we must be involved. Because that question must be answered, isn't it? But secondly, and us to appreciate the nature of our involvement. The question here for is this. How are we involved? Why are we involved and how are we involved? The necessity of involvement and the nature of our involvement. In the first place then, observe with me the necessity of our involvement. Why we must be involved. Look at the passage of scripture before us. And look at verse number four of chapter three of Colossians. These are the words the apostle records. He has been talking about Christ in regards to our sanctification and the change that is taking place and the change that has already occurred. In verse number four, he says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. What is the apostle Paul drawing our attention to? The coming of Christ. See the point? And in verse number five, he says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. That therefore in verse number five is connected to verse number four. In other words, because Christ is coming, therefore, we must put to death what is earthly in us. In other words, the point is this. That we must be involved because that is the evidence that we are preparing for the coming of Christ. You see the point? We must prepare for the coming of Christ. This very Savior in chapter number two, if you look at verse number 9, the apostle records about him. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Now, look at what he has done in his might. And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him, also, you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Spiritual transformation. By putting off the body of the flesh. That is what he did. In other words, the apostle is saying that Christ himself is preparing his people. Do you see the point? That he himself is the one who circumcised the church by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He says, continuing to show how Christ is preparing his church and therefore we love the therefore in verse number five. He said, in him also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him 
in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now, look at amazing words commencing in verse number 13 to 15. The work of Christ. And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your heart. And we who are dead, look at what happens. God made a life together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This is set aside, nailing it to the cross. You begin to see the centrality of the cross of Christ in your preparation for glory. You see the point? That we were dead. We were not in the hospital receiving medication. We were not sick. The point is being made here. We were dead. Dead people cannot respond, can they? They have to be made alive. But who did it? Christ, God through Christ, his son, made us alive together with his son. The believer is being prepared to meet his savior. And the savior is bringing him back to life. Look at what the cross does. The cross cancels the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. Before God, you and I are guilty unless Christ takes away the guilt. Justification. We have to be justified. The righteousness of Christ of necessity has to be imputed on us. And our sins imputed on him. And then it is only then that we can be described as those who are holy before God, those who are righteous before God, so that God can accept us. And so we saw yesterday that in 1 Corinthians 1.30, Christ has become for us the wisdom of God, redemption, wisdom, and sanctification. Even sanctification, Christ has become for us all things. Even the sanctification I'm talking about. <laughs> the point I'm making is very simple. There's nothing you can achieve that is spiritual apart from Christ. And so we begin with Christ of necessity. That is where it begins. It doesn't begin with man. Everything salvific, anything spiritual begins with Christ. And so the Bible begins not with man, but the Bible says, in the beginning, God. This is where it begins. We are beneficiaries of the work of Christ. And so look at verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. This is conclusive defeat to set us free. That we can be sanctified. <laughs> Do you see where it begins? It is this individual who has been set free from the power of sin who begins the process of sanctification. And therefore, we have chapter number three. But I'm starting the second place that we must be involved in our sanctification of necessity because it is evidence on, of new life in Christ. We have seen that in chapter number two. He has made us alive. Look at those words then described in chapter number three now. We saw them yesterday in verse number nine and verse number 10, how we have been made alive. When we are involved in our sanctification, it is evidence of new life in Christ Jesus. The apostle said, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. There has been a change. This individual is a new creation. And so the Bible says, if anyone be in Christ is a new creation, the new creation that we, have, that we are now is because of Christ Jesus. Now it is the new creation that begins the work of sanctification not the old man. And we underscored that one yesterday. In other words, he's saying that our relationship with sin immediately changes when you're born again. We of necessity must insist that our relationship with sin changes immediately when you're saved. In other words, we become enemies and the war intensifies. Look at verse number five again. Why, having been saved, our relationship with sin must immediately change. He says, put to death therefore. And we have been looking at the word death. He is not saying amputate sin, <laughs> cut the leg, okay? 
It's not saying maim the sin. It's not saying paralyze the sin so that it cannot move. He's saying put to death. And I asked the question yesterday, who do you kill? Do you kill a friend or an enemy? You kill an enemy. You can't shoot a friend. Unless you're crazy, isn't it? That's the point. There's an enmity that now immediately we are born again, develop between you and sin. You, know, you now hate sin. And so sin is your enemy. You must, of necessity, therefore deal with sin, which is what is calling putting to death sin. And that war, brothers and sisters, intensifies day by day. The war with the sin, you know, sin won't live. Sin won't go away. It won't leave you alone. It will come in the form of temptation. Temptations, even when you have overcome the same sin over and over again, the same sin will tempt you over and over again. Just when you have left your prayer house about a sin that bothers you, that's the same, same time. Temptation is passing by your eyes. Isn't it? I've mean, just seen even that in a prayer meeting. You are really fasting, and that's the day the neighbor is cooking a nice meal, and the, and, and the aroma is getting the hall, isn't it? And you really, you re, it reminds you that you need to eat. And then you remember that I'm in a prayer meeting. I'm fasting. Sin won't let, let you go. Sin would want to cling to you because the purpose and the mission of sin is to kill you. Sin is not your friend. Sin is your enemy. And so the apostle says, put to death what is earthly in you. Now look at God's attitude towards sin in verse number six. Why do we kill, put to death sin, which is sexual immorality, which is impurity, which is passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry? Verse number six has the answer. On account of these sins you're brought about, the wrath of God is coming. What is God's attitude towards sin? Sin is abhorrent before God, in the eyes of God. And he must, of necessity, judge sin. Hell exists because of sin. If someone asks you, why is there hell? And the simple answer is S-I-N, sin. And so, you begin to see God's attitude towards sin. And so we, too, must have the same attitude. Because we are godly, aren't we? And we are striving to be godly. We must look at sin the way God looks at it. God hates it to the effect that he's punishing sin. And we too must hate sin. And that's why we're being called to put less that sin. This is God's enemy. Are we on God's side? You're on God's side. If you're on God's side, we must be on God's side by putting less sin. Because God hates sin. The point is being made here. Now, look at the contrast again in verse number 8, verse number 9, and verse number 10. We want to move out of Colossians, so we'll draw these points from here. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put on the new self, the old self, with this, you have put off the, the, the old self with these practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge out of the image of its creator. That transition, that change. There's a co contrast between the old self and the new self there. Now, take that import back to verse number eight. That contrast, beginning in verse number seven, in this sense, you two once walked, once is the word, underline it, when you were living in there, there's a time in period, verse number, number eight, but now, but now, a change has taken place. You see the point? There's a way you are relating with sin before you're saved. In verse number 8, but now, since you are a new person in verse number 9 and 10, the words are very shocking. The Bible says, but now, the Bible doesn't say you may. It says, but now, you must put them all away. Do you have the word must? Must is out of necessity. There's no compromise about that. You must put all them away. A word of interest again. In the same verse, but now you must put them all off. I told you that we are not keeping some pet sins. You know, you can keep a pet, isn't it? Like snakes. There are some pet sins that you keep, 
This, the bigger sins, I think I can deal with this, but the smaller sins, I can pet them around. Like lying, isn't it? You know, lying is, seems to be a small sin, isn't it? So that sexual immorality is the biggest sin, isn't it? We are like the Catholics. We, are, we satisfy sin into uh, mortal sins and uh, venial sins, all right? Isn't it? But we do that <laughs> subconsciously. So that we say that the one who has fallen into morality is the worst sin of all. I can keep my lying. I can keep my gossip. Don't we behave like so? That you can lie and escape with it. You can gossip and escape with it. It's not a big sin. The Bible says in verse number 9, it is there black and white. But now you must put them all away. Look at them. Add another list. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. No sin is excluded. All sins, we must put them all away. The picture being painted here, when he says put away, is a language of dressing, clothing. The way you remove your clothes that is filthy and torn and rags is the way he is saying you must remove these sins out of the picture here is of removing sin as a cloth that is filthy, rag. You hate it. You really wish to rush home and remove that filthy dress. The reason here is because you have a new, a new one. Look at verse 12. You have a new cloth. That's the, the joy of it. And so it tells us in verse number 12, put on. In verse number 8, we have put away. We have put off. In verse number 12, we are now putting on. That which is now clean. Put on as a cloth, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. In other words, these things are replacing sins. You have seen them. You see the point? We have seen sin in verse number 5, up to verse number 10. Now, in place of sin, this is what we are now putting on. These things are replacing sin. Put on them as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you, again, the word is must forgive. No option. We must forgive. And above all this, put on love. Again, the same language. Put on love as, a, as addressing which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Surely, you begin to see that the one being addressed here is a new person. Pictured, one, in terms of being raised from the dead, language being shown there, two, in terms of an old self and a new self, and three, in terms of exchange, change of clothes. You see the point? All these figures are meant to help us to, to see the change that takes place when we come to Christ Jesus. But thirdly, we are asking the question, why must we be involved in progressive sanctification? First of all, you have said, it is evidence of preparing for the coming of Christ. Secondly, it is evidence of new life in Christ. But thirdly, it is evidence that we belong to God. How do you show that you truly belong to God? Because everyone says that I'm a child of God. Don't we say so? Even sinners, as you preach to them, they tell you, I'm a child of God. Everyone is a child of God. Isn't it? You can't say that children of God are those who believe in Christ alone. Look at verse 12 again. Verse 12. Let's see children of God and who they are. If truly we are God's child, verse 12 will solve the problem. It says, put on them as God's chosen ones. The ones that God has chosen will love the doctrine of election, don't we? And so many people have come to such passages of election and they have said that one saved, always saved, isn't it? And so I can sit back, relax, and enjoy. God will do this work, isn't it? No, let's see. <laughs> election here in practice. Election in practice, what it means, put on them as God's chosen ones. How do you show that you've been chosen? Holy and beloved. Description of a Christian. If truly we are chosen ones, if truly we are those who have been set apart and we are loved by God, we will put on compassionate hearts. That is what will describe us. 
kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. We will be bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You see that election as a doctrine is not abstract. It's not theory, okay? If truly God has chosen you and saved you and God has called you, of necessity, you must be sanctified. And so, we saw yesterday when Pastor Natalie was speaking that sanctification is evidence of salvation. The point is being made. How do you know that you have been justified when you are being sanctified? We can't know. I can't tell. In this hall, how can I tell if one has believed? It is only when you begin a process of sanctification. I'm seeing a contrast, a clear contrast between what you are before and what you are now. We have seen in verse number eight, there's now, isn't it? And there's the once. There must be a now, but now. A transformation must ensue our necessity. So, election as a doctrine is not in theory. It is not abstract. It leads to a changed life, the point is being made. But then, fourthly, the question we're asking is that why must be involved? The necessity of being involved in our progressive sanctification. It is evidence of preparing for the coming of Christ. It is evidence of new life in Christ. It is evidence that we belong to God. But lastly and fourthly, it is accomplished using ordinary means. It is accomplished using ordinary means. Yes, sanctification is God's way. And we saw that one in 1 Thessalonians 4.3, isn't it? That this is God's will for you. Sanctification. How does God accomplish it? Through us and in us means. Do you see where we have the confluence between God's sovereignty and human responsibility? Because God uses means to accomplish his purposes, like in this case. In sanctification, God does not bypass means. And by what means does God accomplish sanctification in ourselves? John 17, 17. By the word. There's no shortcut, brothers and sisters. There's no shortcut. And so, Pastor Natalie has belabored this morning to show us of the place of hearing God's word, the teaching and the preaching of God's word. Did you see its necessity in the church? Because it's the means by which you're being sanctified. We cannot by any means bypass that means. It is a bridge that we must cross. All of us must hear. And when we have heard the word of God, that word of God informs us of who God is, informs us of what we are, and then what that word of God again conforms us to the image of Christ. And that word of God transforms us into new creatures by the Spirit. The Spirit of God uses the means, which is the word of God, to sanctify the people of God. That's the point. We want to bypass the means. But then, you have seen the question and answered it. Why what must, we, must we be involved? Secondly, let us observe the nature of our involvement. The nature of our involvement. How we must be involved. The how of the question. First of all, we must be proactively involved. We must be proactively involved. When I speak about proactively involved, what I mean is this, that we must take the initiative to be sanctified. Do you see the point? We must take initiative to be sanctified. We must seize every opportunity that God presents to us to grow. Pastor Natalie began by presenting to us one of the opportunities, which is the church, a local church. Why are you a member of a local church? One of the reasons is that you may be sanctified. This is the point. So you take initiative 
It is your duty and responsibility as the one who is seeking to be sanctified to go to church and listen to God's word. You take initiative. You take initiative of fellowshipping as we saw the one another passages. Now, let me give an example of love. How do you grow in love? For example, the Bible says that one of the fruit of the Spirit is that we must be loving. Love is the fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? So how do you grow in love? The answer is simple, by loving. Is there magic? <laughs> Start loving. <laughs> There's no magic. We take initiative in showing love in a local church like this. So when you go in the, <laughs> to church in the morning, there's a new brother, there's a new sister with whom you have never fellowshiped. It is the time not to wait for them to come to you and say hi to you and talk, tell, tell you their problems. It is you to go to them and ask them, brother, sister, how are you doing the lot? What problems are you experiencing? What struggles do you have in your faith? What struggles do you have when you read God's word? What don't you understand? You must take initiative. It is only then that you will show that you are loving. Love takes initiative. How did God show his love for us? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, isn't it? Did God take initiative? He took initiative. Did God wait for us to come to him so that we are saved? What does Christ say? The son of man came to seek and save the lost. Takes initiative. Genesis chapter number three and verse number seven. What does God do when man has run away from him? He's hiding. He pursues him. Isn't it? He looks out for him. Adam, where are you? That is love. Love is proactive. If you want to grow in love, you must be proactive. The point is being made. There's no magic when it comes to these things. But then secondly, you must be practically involved. First of all, you must be proactively involved. Secondly, you must be practically involved. In other words, you must do it personally. You must do this personally. And this is the point, that sanctification is the test that your Christianity is practical Christianity and not merely professed Christianity. In Kenya, almost everyone, 80% of us, confess to be Christians, isn't it? We are a Christian nation. But the truth is, are we mere professing Christians or are we practicing Christians? What will distinguish between professing Christians and practicing Christians is sanctification. Growth. Growth. How do you distinguish between a dead suit and a live suit? A, a, a cut trunk of, 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 the, of the wood. You know, if, if I fell this tree down, I cut it a bit. How do I know that it is dead? Having observed for some years. When there's nothing sprouting on it, isn't it? It's gone. You know that it's gone. But if it's still alive, even after you, after you cut it, it will sprout. Eh? Some bud, it will do some budding. And I know that, oh, it's still alive now. Still has life. Life shows growth. When there is life, there's growth. We have been made alive. How do we show that you are alive? Growth. When babies have been born, how do we know that they are alive? They breathe and they grow. They grow. And so we distinguish between true Christians and false Christians when you are practically involved in your sanctification. Look at how it is put again in verse number 5 and in verse number 12. The Bible is very clear. Now, the Apostle Paul is giving an instruction to the body of Christ, the church. And he's telling these individuals, put to death. In verse number 12, he's telling them, put on them. Who is doing the putting on and who is doing the putting to death? Is it the Holy Spirit or the, Christ, or, or the individual? The individual. He's the one who is now putting on. The, the, the government is the one who is now put into death the sin in him, what is earthly in him. He is practically involved. In other words, look at verse number five again. 
Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. So he's inviting us to examine ourselves. And we must come to realize out of knowledge and identify that which is earthly in us. Because this list is not exhaustive. He's giving us examples. So we look at ourselves in light of God's word. We do self-examination. We do self-evaluation. We look at ourselves against the mirror of God's word and ask ourselves, what is it that God requires of me as one who has been born again? And then you come to verse number five. And you say, God is already identifying sins that we must deal with. And so as you look at these sins, my role, my responsibility is to identify them. Having identified them, then I put them to death. Come to this table, this catalog, look at it again and again and again. And ask yourself, of this mentioned here, these sins, which is your sin here? You may not be struggling with sexual immorality. But you may come to verse number eight. A lot of them are mentioned there. Almost all of us fall in that category of verse number eight. I don't know if anyone in this hall who cannot, who, 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 who will miss verse number eight. Anger. Anger. Is there someone who has overcome anger here? Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> what about wrath? How about malice and slander? Because pastors do counseling every week, isn't it? Because we have slandered one another, isn't it? <laughs> the church is being divided. Obscene talk. This is us. The point I'm making. This is us. We cannot escape. We must come and look at God's word and ask ourselves, what are these non-sins that I know about myself that I'm struggling with? The Bible says I must put them to death. Practically speaking. But in the third place, we have said in the first place, we must be proactively involved. Secondly, we must be practically involved. That practical involvement is very important because personally hinted something that I wanted to say. But let me just say quickly that in circles, there are some circles whereby um, you are told that you can believe in Christ Jesus, but you need something that is extra, which is called deliverance. Have you ever heard of the deliverance process? Deliverance. That some lying is not ordinary. It is from the devil, so you must be delivered from it. So and so has a sin that is very stubborn. That, that lying of hers. That your anger. Sister, we need to deliver you. So you need to call a deliverance meeting. See the point? Is that how we deal with it? You personally, the Bible says, put to death. You're not being asked to go to a prayer meeting. To go to a cashier and roll over the, on the floor. In the name of them being delivered. Please, you're going to soil your garments for nothing. You come back, you begin to lie just immediately. In fact, you lie in the same, same vehicle. As, as you're calling home, where are you? Pastor Nafil was telling us. You say, I am almost there. I'm just around. And then you're, it's, it's when you're leaving Nairobi. I'm just around in town. And you have left a deliverance meeting. To be delivered from lying. It won't, be, it won't deal with it. We must be practically involved. But thirdly, we must be persistently involved. We must be persistently involved in pursuing sanctification. Now, the language used to describe our faith, our Christian life, is a language of pursue holiness. Strive for holiness. Isn't it? Strive, pursue, those are the you know, terms that are showing us of something of some difficulty involved. In other words, when the Bible uses those words, vocabulary of the Bible, we are being called to endurance and perseverance. Do you see where the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints merges sanctification? Persistence. So the Bible says, pursue righteousness. Strive for holiness. Those are the words being used because there's no quick way of being sanctified. 
<laughs> it's not a quick way. You have to strive. Now, more languages used to describe our Christian work. The Bible says it is a race. Now, thankfully, in Kenya, we are a running nation. And so we go to athletics, Olympics. We know athletics, those who are athletes who compete for a race. What does it take for an athlete to win a race? Endurance, isn't it? Because when he does not endure and persevere to the closing line, the finish line, he won't receive any crowning. Our own Kipchoge must run and endure to the point that sometimes we cheer him up, isn't it? Even when he's getting exhausted, so that he finishes the race. Because it is only when he has finished the race that he'll be crowned the winner. It doesn't matter whether you have gone only 23 laps, remaining 24 laps, remaining one lap to make it 24. It doesn't matter. The race is 5,000 kilometers, and you have done 4,000.5. You won't even be recognized. No one will know that you, you ran. You won't even be given a number. Haven't you seen that? Only those who finish the race are given numbers, isn't it? Even if you're the last. That's the point. You must endure. You must persevere. You must persistently pursue righteousness. Another word used to describe this is the word warfare. We Christians are in a battle. Again, the language of a battle is a language of warfare. We are fighting. We need endurance and stamina and perseverance as we are fighting. War does not require passivity. You must be there. Involved. Brothers, the point I'm making is simple. That sin is a very stubborn enemy. We must fight it repeatedly and every day. The Bible says when the devil had tempted Christ, he only left but for an opportune time, isn't it? To come back later. That is the point. It won't leave. It will come back again. Now, brothers, let me encourage you. There are times you will lose heart or, or feel like losing heart because like David, David sins in Psalm 51, we know David's story against Bathsheba and Uriah. What happens to David when he has sinned? He's a, he's a believer. What happened to him? Did he quit being a Christian? Did he quit? What did he do? He came back to God, isn't it? And he agonized over his sins and said, have mercy on me. Please have mercy on me. Against you have I said, only you have I said, be merciful to me, God. Perseverance. Even when you fall, my brother and my sister, persevere. Fall and rise again. Come tell the church. My brothers, I have sinned against God. Help me. Perseverance. And then lastly, we must be prayerfully involved. We must be prayerfully involved. You have said, we must be proactively involved. We must be practically involved. We must be persistently involved. And lastly, we must be prayerfully involved. Now, look at chapter number four and verse number two. The words described, the words used there to describe prayer. The apostle says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Continue steadfastly. Steadfastly is a word of endurance, isn't it? Perseverance. Now praying, even in prayer. Being watchful in it. Why being watchful? Why persevering? Why steadfastly? Because we are in a warfare. We are in a race. We need endurance as we fight the enemy. Prayer expresses our inability. We are telling God when you are going to pray, God, I am dealing with sexual immorality. God, I am dealing with slander. God, I am dealing with wrath. I have come to you to grant me your strength and your grace and mercy to overcome this sin. You must 
realize your own inability. If truly you have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone. It's going to God and asking God for help, for strength, for his spirit, that by his spirit you may fight sin. Prayer is a way of relying on God. It expresses that we are relying on God fully. And that's why the Bible says, pray that you don't enter into temptation. Do you see prayer and, and sin? Yeah. Pray that you may not enter into temptation. We must pray. We must pray persistently, steadfastly, continually. Being watchful. So that as you're being sanctified, we ask God, we point out those specific sins you're struggling with. Tell God, they say, and ask him, help me. As I put to death this sin, please help me. But we must pray with thanksgiving. Continue to serve us in prayer. Being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Quite thanksgiving as we pray even for sanctification. Because as we express our gratitude to God in prayer, we are telling God that, God, I am not where I ought to be, but I'm not where I was. See the point? God, ever since you saved me, I have seen childlike steps in my faith. I was not like this, but now you have made me this type of person. God, I thank you. Is if you do so, you will actually be proving that you believe that salvation is by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Because all the glory should go back to God. You see the point? So that even when you have won the war, when you are, you are, you are seemingly overcoming sin, it is to the glory of God. So you go back to God and tell him, God, thank you that I'm making strides in my faith. Thank you. Because this year has been so gracious to me. I mean, what are your new year, year resolutions then? What do you pray for as the year begins? For a better job, isn't it? For a spouse. Why not get a corner and just kneel down in deep condition and tell God, God, thank you. If I look at when I was saved and how the, the strides I've made today, God, you have transformed me. I am not there yet, but I'm seeing strides. May the glory come to you. That is the heart of someone who knows that salvation belongs to God. That is the heart of a reformed person, the point. To be reformed <laughs> is to give glory to God. What is the chief end of, end of man? Is to glorify God and enjoy that God forever. So that even sanctification, the end product of this sanctification, the chief of it, the zenith, the apex of it, the summit, is God's glory. Not me. That God. Thank you because you saved a wretched sinner like me. You are sanctifying me by your spirit and by your word that all the glory may come to you. Brothers and sisters, this is what we've been called to. And I urge you and ask you, please be proactively involved in your sanctification. Be practically involved in your sanctification. Persist, be persistent in your sanctification. And be prayerful as you ask God to be sanctified.